The most common ways that people are using it are for anxiety, for sleep, and for pain. Those are probably the top three. People use it also for mood, for inflammation, but pain and anxiety are two of the top ones, and those actually lead to the sleep. So like I said, CBD isn't a sedative on its own. So when people take it, it usually helps with whatever is keeping them from sleeping. And a lot of times that's pain or anxiety. Hello and welcome to the Ultimate Health Podcast, episode 352. Jesse Chapp is here with Marnie Wasserman, and we are here to take your health to the next level. Each week, we'll bring you inspiring and informative conversations about health and wellness, covering topics of nutrition, lifestyle, fitness, mindset, and so much more. And this week, we're chatting with Jenny Sansusi. She's the author of The Rebel's Apothecary, a practical guide to the healing magic of cannabis, CBD, and mushrooms. She's a certified health coach and creator of the wellness blog Healthy Crush, where she's been writing since 2008. Jenny is a graduate of the Institute for Integrative Nutrition and has been trained by functional medicine doctor Frank Lippman in New York City. And Frank is actually a previous guest to the show. And over the years, we've covered medicinal mushrooms quite a bit, but cannabis is a totally new topic for the show. It was really fun to read Jenny's book and research for this interview, and we had a great conversation. And Jenny has such a personal connection to this topic because her father was diagnosed with pancreatic cancer, and this got her digging into the research and learning more about cannabis and medicinal mushrooms and how they could help him. And it ends up that in the end, he ended up combining these with a conventional treatment plan for cancer. And she shares that story and gets into so much great practical information when it comes to cannabis, CBD, and medicinal mushrooms. So you're going to take a lot away from this one. And some of the highlights include cannabis has always been used as medicine, the benefits of CBD, microdosing with THC, medicinal mushrooms for everyday use, and comparing medicinal mushrooms with psychedelic magic mushrooms. We'd really appreciate it if you could help spread this episode out into the world, share it with friends, family members, other people in your life, and we thank you ahead of time. So without further ado, here we go with Jenny Sansusi. Hello, Jenny. Welcome to the podcast. Excited to chat with you today. Hi, thanks so much for having me. I'm happy to be here. Well, we have a really interesting and important topic to get into. Your new book was fantastic, The Rebel's Apothecary. Today, we're going to be talking about cannabis and medicinal mushrooms. So just a fascinating topic and lots of info here. Yeah, my favorite topic. Let's talk first about the catalyst that got you to dive deeper into this topic. I know before this, you were a nutritionist and you were actually working in a functional medicine clinic and you were working with a previous guest actually of the show, Dr. Frank Lippman. Let's just fast forward a little bit though to 2017. It's the day before Thanksgiving and your dad was diagnosed with stage four pancreatic cancer. So first of all, how did this diagnosis come about? What kind of symptoms was he having? Before he was officially diagnosed for about three or four months, probably, he had been having some digestive issues. And he started to complain about his digestion, which we had never really heard him do before. So it kind of got me thinking, you know, I had I had worked for Dr. Frank Lippman, and we had he had a ton of different digestive supplements. And we were always working with patients with digestive issues. So my first thought was, okay, let me get him, you know, some herbs, maybe his gut bacteria is imbalanced. And so I tried to get him on some supplements to help, but nothing was helping. And so he ended up going to the doctor to just get checked out for the digestive stuff. Uh, they said they found abnormalities in the pancreas. And that was the first sign that we had that something more serious was going on. We didn't know it was cancer quite yet. That was um, midway through November when he got that appointment. And then, yeah, it was the day before Thanksgiving. So my my family was all together and we went to the hospital. And that's when we found out it was definitely stage four pancreatic cancer that had spread to the liver. Obviously, a traumatic diagnosis. And you mentioned you guys were all together. What do you do first thing when you hear that? Yeah, it was definitely one of those moments where everything just, the world just stopped. We were sitting in the cafeteria of the hospital at a table. And when my dad came out and sat down and told us, because he had been in there with the doctor and we had been waiting, he told us. And it was just one of those moments where you just wish that you could take back what you just heard. You know, like you're in such denial and all you're hoping for is like, false alarm, everything's fine, you know, but that wasn't the case. So my sister and I 
as soon as we found out, we just we didn't want to totally have a breakdown in front of my dad. So we went out to the parking garage and sat in the car and just cried. And it's just a before and after life moment. Everything changes when you hear a diagnosis like that. So we were really in a lot of grief and shock. It was definitely a few days of just feeling really overwhelming sadness before we started to jump into, okay, what can we do here to help kind of getting into action mode. But anyone that has gotten a cancer diagnosis or knows somebody that has gotten one and loves somebody that has gotten one knows it is a very difficult feeling to go through. I can't even imagine. And as somebody who's a nutritionist and you're in the health and wellness space already, when you get to that point and you decide you're going to dig in and, and you know look for alternative therapies, where's the first place you turn to? What do you dig into? Yeah. So I took on the role in my family really quickly of saying, OK, if there's any natural remedies available, I'm going to find them. You know, I had been in the wellness world for so many years. I you know, had worked for the functional medicine doctor and I knew a lot of people in the wellness world that were experts in different you know, topics, superfoods and supplements and herbs and alternative medicines of all kinds. So I just said, OK, you can you know, do whatever you want as far as the Western medicine goes. I knew my dad was going to do chemo. I was not about to try to get him to do otherwise. I knew that that was what he was going to do. And I didn't know enough about it at the time to even make suggestions in that sense. So. I was like, all right, I'm going to dive into what we can do with food, supplements, and whatever else I can find. And I definitely didn't even think about cannabis or mushrooms as something that I would go to. I was pretty much just blank slate. Let's see what I can find. So I did first reach out to Dr. Lippman. And that is when I got on the trail of medicinal mushrooms because there's a compounding pharmacist that works at his office that said, hey, you should look into turkey tail mushroom. And I said, all right, turkey tail. I wrote that down. I called um, David Wolf, who's a superfood, wild food nutrition expert, and I've known him for many years, and he's one of the people that got me interested in nutrition. And I thought if he, you know, he must know something that I can do. And he also said medicinal mushrooms, particularly chaga, he recommended. So I started to get some people saying medicinal mushrooms. I reached out to just a couple of my other friends who are health coaches, and one of my friends said, why don't you look into CBD? I've been hearing good things. And another friend told me to look into a supplement called AHCC, which is derived from shiitake mushrooms. So mushrooms kept coming up and then CBD came up. And so I just started to do the research into those two things first. And what I found was enough for me to kind of take those two areas and make those the, the leading things that we started with for him. And at the time, again, being somebody who is in the health and wellness space, what is your experience with cannabis and medicinal mushrooms at the time? Are you taking them for your own health and wellness or or what does that look like? So this was before CBD started to become popular. It was kind of just starting to, there were whispers about CBD, but no one really understood what the legality was or what was going on with it. So I had heard a little bit about CBD, but I had not tried it. I hadn't used cannabis personally in many, many years because in 2007, I quit drinking and quit all drugs, which for me at the time that included cannabis. And I just never thought I would have any reason to revisit it. I just I didn't really care that much about cannabis. I thought all the legalization fight was just, you know, people wanting to get high and, and not that, you know, there's anything wrong with that, but that's kind of my outlook on it. I did not look at it as a medicine. I had never thought of it that way. So I just didn't really my focus wasn't there at all. With mushrooms, I was using four sigmatic products, the packets that you can mix into drinks. But it was very much, I was using them the way that I would use any other supplement or superfood or um, wellness product. I was just kind of experimenting with them, but definitely had not done a deep dive. And you mentioned there in 2007, you were partying and, and quit your drinking and drugs. I know 2008 is when you started your blog. Talk about what the catalyst was for getting involved in that and starting that. When I first quit drinking, <laughs> I really quickly realized that. I was using drugs and alcohol to feel good with the foods that I was eating and the lifestyle choices that I was making. I didn't actually feel good once the drugs and alcohol were gone. And I was like, oh, man, I need to figure out how to actually feel good and not just use these substances to be self-medicating all the time. So I got really interested in nutrition right off the bat just to be able to feel as good as possible. And when I started to get interested in nutrition, I started to want to share everything that I was finding because I started to become very fascinated by everything I was learning. 
And this was my first foray into wellness or nutrition or anything like that. I'd never really, you know, even thought about it before then. So I started a blog to not only share what I was learning just about health and nutrition, but just to express myself in general. So my first blog was not not a nutrition specific blog. I worked at a corporate health website at the time, kind of like a WebMD type of website. And when I was working for them, I saw how much money they were making. And this was about like $20 million a month they were making, I believe, on a health website. And I thought to myself, okay, if these people are making $20 million a month writing about health, I could probably figure out a way to pay my rent by writing about the things that I'm learning about in health. So that's how it all got started. So once your dad gets the diagnosis, you start digging into the research, learning about cannabis, learning more about medicinal mushrooms. When you bring this information to him, how does he respond? He was really open. And, you know, I get a lot of messages from people saying, how do I bring this up to my parents? You know, they're they're, you know, not really open to it. But my dad was really open because he had just watched a documentary recently about medical marijuana that he had just downloaded this documentary because he thought he's it sounded interesting. And he watched this documentary about how cancer patients were using cannabis oil, a very high potency cannabis oil to treat their chemotherapy side effects and even potentially kill the cancer cells. And so he had seen it and he was open to it. And it was the exact same time that I was starting to research CBD. And with the mushrooms, he was just kind of like, as long as my oncologist says okay to this, why not try? He was very open to experiment. So I feel very lucky in that sense. And how far into his conventional treatment did you begin, you know, adding in these supplements and, you know, these medicines, these plant medicines as an adjunct? We got started with CBD right away because he needed to get a medical card in order to access anything with THC in it. So I was able to get him some CBD capsules in New York, and he started taking those. And the first thing he noticed from taking those was that his joint pain went away. And this was not even cancer related, but he was taking so much Advil for his joint pain just from like walking up the stairs. And he's been an athlete his whole life. So he just has he has some joint pain. And he was like, I don't even need to take Advil anymore. I can just walk up and down the stairs with no pain. So that was a really cool, you know, unrelated to the cancer before and after moment for him with the CBD. And that must have, you know, opened his mind to other possibilities, having that response to something early on. Yeah. So that was a cool thing that we noticed right away. And then once we got him his medical card here in Massachusetts, where he lives, that was probably about a month into his treatments. And then he was able to start taking products with a higher level of THC in them, which he's been taking ever since. He did have some side effects from the chemotherapy at the beginning, but once he got onto this cannabis oil, most of those side effects started to go away. And at what point was it that you moved back home to help take care of him? After he got diagnosed, I basically said, okay, this is going to be my focus right now. So I want to get him on a plan. So I knew that I wanted to stay home in my parents' town for at least a couple of months. Because, you know, for people who don't know about stage four pancreatic cancer, typically it's not a good diagnosis to get. Not that any cancer diagnosis is good, but this one typically moves pretty fast and it's pretty unpredictable. So I didn't know how long we had with my dad. I was like, I'm going to come home for at least a few months. So I ended up moving into a condo that was, you know, about 15 minutes from my parents' house just for a few months. And that was end of December. So it was like a month after his diagnosis that I moved here and just kind of took over <laughs> getting him on his home treatment plan. And what's the history of cannabis being used as medicine? I know nowadays it's, you know, taboo, but it's starting to come back into, you know, the mainstream a little better, at least seems like it from my window. But what's the history there? Was this ever something that people were using more regularly? There's documentation of cannabis being used as a medicine thousands of years ago. You know, it it was once listed as one of the 50 fundamental herbs of Chinese medicine. This is thousands of years ago. So it's always been used as a medicine. And in the 1800s, actually, in the U.S., it was used by a lot of doctors. And it was in, in pharmacies, cannabis tinctures you could buy for things like pain and depression and insomnia. It was very widely used until it became outlawed. So now it's just starting to have its renaissance, which is exciting, but there's a long way to go still. Let's talk about the difference between hemp and marijuana, because there's so many different hemp products out there in the world these days, including hemp seeds that you can use in your baking or smoothies and different recipes. But I think it's important early on we make that differentiation between the two. 
This is one that gets can get confusing for people because, you know, there'll be products out there that just say hemp oil and is that CBD oil? And, you know, what's the difference between hemp and marijuana? And really, hemp and marijuana are two different plants within the cannabis family. And the only thing that distinguishes them legally is the amount of THC in the plant. So a hemp plant is any plant that has 0.3% THC or less. And a marijuana plant has 0.3% THC or more. So basically, the hemp plants, those are the ones that are, are federally legal in the U.S. right now. And the marijuana plants are the ones that you can only access those at dispensaries. And the part of the plants that the medicine comes from, that the THC and the CBD come from, is the flower of the plant or the bud. And hemp seed oil and hemp seeds and the things that you use for cooking, those don't have CBD or THC in them. Those are from a completely different part of the plant. So it's different parts of the plants that are used for different things, but the medicine is in the flower. And the THC and CBD, those are the cannabinoids. And you also talk about a number of other compounds that are in cannabis that contribute to health and wellness. So can you talk about what those are? Yeah, sure. Well, CBD and THC are the two most prevalent cannabinoids inside the plant. But there are hundreds of others, but those ones are present in the highest amounts. But I think, you know, in the future, they'll probably be breeding plants that have, you know, higher amounts of some of the other products. There's terpenes within the cannabis plant that are also can be medicinal. And those have different kinds of effects and those give different aromas to different strains of cannabis. So, you know, there's some terpenes that give a citrusy scent, some that give more of a woodsy scent, and they all have different medicinal aspects, which is really cool to start looking into. And if you go to medical dispensaries where they know a lot about the products, they sometimes will have the full terpene profile on there. So you can look and see which kind of effects do I want. And that can um, give you the more, more of the uplifting effects or some of the more sedating effects. So those are the terpenes. And you talk about something in your book called the entourage effect, where these different compounds in cannabis are actually working together and they have a synergy together rather than being in isolation. Yeah. And that's one of the things that I always want to make sure people know about when they're buying a CBD product or any cannabis product is that a CBD isolate is very different than a full spectrum CBD product because the compounds in cannabis, which I said there's hundreds of different compounds in cannabis, they all work together to boost each other's effects. And it's been shown in studies that you need way more CBD if it's just an isolate than you would need if you took a full spectrum product because the other compounds just boost up the effectiveness so much more. So if you find a product that's just CBD, that would usually be like a clear looking liquid if we're talking about CBD tinctures and you don't feel anything. That's something that I hear from a lot of people. They're like, I tried CBD and it didn't work, but they may have tried an isolate and you just need to take a much higher amount or just switch to a, what's called a full spectrum product. And it's also important to consider the ratio of CBD to THC because THC is the compound in there that gives you that high feeling. And when you have enough CBD as a high enough ratio with the THC, that can actually counteract that feeling and you can get more THC in without necessarily getting high. Yep, that's true. And the different ratios of THC to CBD, again, are only going to be at this time available in dispensaries. But in California, for instance, they have, in most dispensaries out there, they have a huge array of different ratios of CBD to THC products. So you can really choose, like, you may do well with a, a four to one ratio, meaning four times the CBD to the THC, or an eight to one ratio, or a 10 to one ratio. You can really experiment with it and find your sweet spot for where you feel relief, but not intoxication that feels uncomfortable. And now we're going to take a quick break from our chat with Jenny to give a shout out to our show partner, Beekeepers Naturals. Beekeepers Naturals has a bee chill hemp honey, and this delivers a powerful 28 milligrams of hemp oil per teaspoon so you can find your bliss. It's made with USA grown hemp and is non-psychoactive and contains 0% THC, meaning you can get all the chill with none of the trip. It contains four ingredients, 100% raw enzymatic honey, hemp oil, coconut medium chain triglycerides or MCT, and sunflower lecithin. So you can enjoy a half teaspoon when you're feeling stressed, anxious, or overrun during a busy day, or when you're ready for bed, you can indulge in a full teaspoon. And as a listener of our show, you get 15% off your beekeeper's purchase by going to ultimahealthpodcast.com slash beekeepers. Again, that URL is ultimahealthpodcast.com slash beekeepers. 
On top of that, if you spend $60 or more, you get free shipping. It's time to take your relaxation to the next level with Bee Chill Hemp Honey. Oh, and by the way, it tastes great too. Now we're going to give a shout out to our other show partner, Sun Warrior. Sun Warrior Warrior Blend Protein is a favorite of ours. It's organic, plant-based, and tastes incredible in our smoothies and smoothie bowls. It's soy-free, contains no added sugars, it's grain-free, vegan, and blends in smoothly. Another thing we like to do is blend together some Warrior Blend Protein with the nut milk and pour it over our favorite grain-free cereal, and it just powers up that cereal bowl. It comes in a number of flavors, berry, chocolate, natural, and vanilla, and we typically go with vanilla because it has a nice flavor and it can be mixed with anything. And as a listener of our show, you get 20% off your Sun Warrior purchase by going to ultimahealthpodcast.com slash sunwarrior. Again, that URL is ultimahealthpodcast.com slash sunwarrior. And on top of that, if you spend $50 or more, you get free shipping. Upgrade your next smoothie, smoothie bowl, or grain-free cereal bowl with Warrior Blend Protein from Sun Warrior. And now back to our chat with Jenny. An important point you make in the book is to start low and go slow. So start lower than you might think you're going to need and, and work your way up and really test the waters to, to make sure you're not getting that high feeling if that's not something you're looking for. Right. Especially, yeah, with THC products, with CBD products that have that 0.3% THC or less, like you can find at health food stores all around the country, you can be a little more liberal with your starting dosages. With something with THC, I would say start at like one milligram of THC and see how you feel. But with CBD, you could start around five and kind of move up depending on the kind of relief you're looking for. Let's get into some of the benefits of CBD. And you talk about how when you first tried it, the thing you notice is it helped calm your anxiety. So tell us that story. Well, when I first tried CBD, I was trying it for sleep because I, at the time I was having a lot of trouble sleeping and I'm sure the stress of my dad being sick and a lot of other things going on was not helping with that. So I took CBD before bed one night. And so I realized after I took the CBD before bed that the reason I was having trouble sleeping was anxiety. I was having racing thoughts. I couldn't keep my mind quiet. My body just felt like it was on alert. And once I took the CBD, it wasn't like a sedative, like it just knocked me out. It was just that my body was able to relax and my mind was able to just quiet down a little bit. And it was really noticeable for me. And that was probably 10 or 15 milligrams of CBD that I took that night. And that was my before and after moment with CBD. You know, my dad's moment was the joint pain and mine was the sleep because it just felt like I was finally able to not be agitated. It was a big deal. And what are some of the other benefits people can experience with supplementing with CBD? The most common ways that people are using it are for anxiety, for sleep, and for pain. Those are probably the top three. People use it also for mood, for inflammation, but pain and anxiety are two of the top ones, and those actually lead to the sleep. So like I said, CBD isn't a sedative on its own. So when people take it, it usually helps with whatever is keeping them from sleeping. And a lot of times that's pain or anxiety. And what are the different methods people can consider when deciding to use it? Mm, there's so many different methods. Well, depending on what you're using it for, there's some methods work better for others than others and for different things. So I guess it depends how quickly you want the effects to come on and how long you want them to last because each method of delivery is going to be a little bit different. So there's inhalation, which is, you know, what people usually think of when they think of cannabis is smoking pot. So they're smoking and vaping. And that is going to be the quickest onset of feeling the relief. But also, there's a lot of things that can irritate the lungs with smoking. And obviously, there's concerns about vaping with vape oils. So if you're going to use inhalation, a lot of the cannabis doctors that I have spoken to say to use a dry herb vape pen, which is basically vaping, but with the cannabis flower and not oil. So you basically just heat it up, but not to the point of smoking. And that can be a healthier way to inhale. That's the fastest way. But the second fastest way, which is probably the most common, is a tincture under the tongue. So an oil-based tincture that you just put under the tongue hold it for 60 seconds, and then you should feel the effects within 15 minutes or so. If you feel nothing, you may just be at a, at a low dose and need to move up a little bit. So you have to experiment with your dose a little there. But that's probably the most common. But then there's also capsules that you can take. You can take edibles or use a topical. 
And capsules and edibles kind of work the same in the sense that they have to go through your digestive system first. So those can take a little bit longer to feel the effects, but they also last a little bit longer. So you just have to play around with some of the the different methods and see what works for you. And you mentioned the skin there, and I know there's actually receptors on the skin for cannabis. So talk about how that works. We have receptors all throughout our body that interact directly with the cannabis molecules. So the CBD and the THC work a little bit differently with the receptors. But we have receptors you know, all through our brain and spinal cord and our immune system and our skin and all of our organs. And so it's no surprise that it works for so many different things, which is really interesting. And we have a lot of receptors on the skin. So people are seeing really good results with things like acne and eczema and psoriasis and anything skin related using a CBD topical or even using CBD internally can really help to soothe those things. And it's really interesting riffing off what you just said there. Our bodies are actually designed to receive cannabis. We have receptors in our body and we produce our own cannabinoids that fit into those receptors. So we're actually working with the system our body already has built into it. Yeah. And it's awesome because this system is there to regulate and keep our bodies in homeostasis or balance. So it can regulate so many different things throughout the body. So, you know, pain, inflammation, anxiety, depression, all of those things are are regulated by the system. So we do produce our own molecules. So the system isn't made just for the cannabis plant. We produce our own inner cannabinoids, which are called endocannabinoids. The ones from the cannabis plant are called phytocannabinoids, but they all work within the same system. And it's been shown that the endocannabinoids that we produce, the different levels of these cannabinoids, everyone has different levels of these naturally in their body. It's kind of like how we all have a different digestive system. We all have a different endocannabinoid tone, which is the natural levels of these compounds. But using CBD and THC can help to change the levels of these compounds for us and help them you know, help keep the body in balance even more, which is really cool. And it's interesting that CBD and THC each work differently on that system, where CBD is actually blocking the enzyme that's breaking these endocannabinoids down, and THC fits like a lock and key into the receptors in the body. Yeah, exactly. So THC mimics our own natural compounds in the body, and CBD helps to elevate those compounds for us. So they both Yeah, they both work differently, but they both work to help us stay in balance. And that's the reason why it's important to experiment because everyone's going to be affected a little bit differently because, you know, you may have lower levels, I may have higher levels. So when I take 10 milligrams of CBD, it might feel totally different than when you do. So there's no one size fits all dose. So if somebody's new to CBD and wants to give it a try, it sounds like a tincture is probably the best place to start. I think that's the best place to start because it's the easiest place to measure a really specific dose. If you're inhaling or if you're taking an edible or or a capsule, like I said, because it goes through your digestive system, it can be hard to tell how much medicine is actually being absorbed into your system based on, you know, what's being broken down in digestion. So if you take a tincture, you can actually measure your dose drop by drop which is really, really helpful. So you can find your therapeutic window of how many how many drops or how many milligrams work for whatever you're looking to relieve. And you mentioned how taking CBD helped you with your sleep, and that would be taking it at the end of the day. But what about taking CBD during the day? I'm sure a lot of people are thinking, you know, I don't want to feel high or feel tired. And obviously the CBD oil is going to have different amounts of THC or no THC, depending how safe is it to take CBD during the day and then say work or drive a car, things like that? So many people do take CBD during the day, often in lower amounts, because like I said, everybody's different. But across the board, the general consensus is that a smaller amount of CBD can sometimes be more wake promoting or alerting or can you know help you to focus and a larger amount of CBD might be a little bit more, you know, it might make you tired. So I would say experiment with taking a low dose of CBD on what I call a low stakes day. So I wouldn't just try it right before you're about to go give a presentation or maybe not right before you're about to go drive if you've never taken it before and you don't know if it's going to make you a little drowsy. I would take it on a day where maybe you're at home and don't have a lot of high stakes things to do and just see how you feel and start to experiment that way. And if somebody is finding that taking cannabis is working for them, is this the kind of thing you'd want to take on a daily basis? Does it have like a an effect that builds up over time or is it just more take as you need? You can take it on a daily basis and it's one of those things that can kind of 
tone your your system so you can take it on a daily basis and it's like a supplement and the, the effects will will be compounded. So some people say they start to feel the beneficial effects after a couple of weeks of taking it every day. You know, some people feel it right away. Some people maybe takes a couple of days or a couple of weeks to just get your system really, really accustomed to it. So yeah, you can take it every day. And you talk about in your book, microdosing with THC. This is a really interesting thing to think about and possibly experiment if it feels right to the right person. But how much are we talking here and what benefits might someone see? I mean, as we've already talked about with my background and story, I don't use THC to get high. And I don't even like the feeling of, of feeling high from THC. So for people who are really sensitive or new users to cannabis, around two milligrams of CBD, I mean, of THC can be the psychoactive threshold, which is basically the point where you might start to feel a little bit high, whether that's just kind of like a little bit of brain fog or a little tiredness, you might start to feel it around two milligrams. Some people need five milligrams or 10 milligrams to feel that feeling. But personally, for me, one milligram is kind of my max, which is a really small amount. And just for reference, Around 10 milligrams is usually the recreational dose that would get most people pretty high. So one milligram is really small. You know, I have a tincture that is a THC tincture, and I have a one-to-one -one tincture that's CBD and THC. And if I just take a drop of it or enough to have one milligram of THC, it can really enhance my focus, my mood. It just kind of takes the edge off a little bit without feeling high at all. So that's, for me, what microdosing with THC feels like. Let's shift into medicinal mushrooms and start off by talking about what are some of your favorite types these days and what are the ones you're taking on a regular basis? Well, you know, right now, since we're going through this global pandemic, <laughs> I've been really focused on all the mushrooms are really good for the immune system. But in particular, some of the ones that I've been taking on a daily basis are chaga and reishi. And those are both very good for the immune system. Also, shiitake has been shown to be antiviral. So I'm not going to claim that it's going to be, you know, helping with the coronavirus, but it has been shown to be antiviral in other ways. So shiitake mushrooms are a really good one to not only just eat more of, but take in a tincture or an extract if you can find it. But chaga and reishi are two that I take every day. And you can use those as powder extracts that you mix into coffee or tea or just hot water, or you can use those in a tincture. If you have access to actually like a chunk of chaga or a piece of reishi, you can actually simmer that in water and make tea out of it. Lion's mane is another one that I take every day, and that's a good one for brain and focusing. So I'll take that before I sit down to work. So chaga, reishi, and lion's mane are the three that I'm, I'm pretty much having on rotation. And then shiitake, yeah, that's another really good one to add in. And just to further differentiate for people, you, you talked about it, but just to get into the specifics here... The lion's mane and shiitake, these are mushrooms you can cook up and use as a culinary mushroom versus reishi and chaga, you would need to make a tea or take them in a tincture form because they're a, they're a hard woody mushroom. You couldn't really eat it. Exactly. There's, I believe, three of the mushrooms that I go over in the book are culinary mushrooms. So that's shiitake, lion's mane, like you said, and maitake. And those three mushrooms you can cook and eat, and they're all really delicious and have great benefits. But cooking and eating the mushrooms is obviously not going to be the most potent medicinal way to take them. It's just a really great way to get those mushrooms into your life. But if you're wanting to take a more potent dose, you would want to do a tincture or a powder extract. And when we're looking for those tinctures or powders, we want to look for dual extract. And can you explain what that is? Some of the compounds within the mushrooms can be extracted with water only, but some have to be extracted in alcohol. So if you have a mushroom supplement that's double extracted, it means that it's been extracted in water and it's been extracted in alcohol. And then those two are combined to give you as many beneficial compounds as possible. So that's, I would definitely look for a double extracted mushroom for most mushrooms. Lion's mane, I don't believe you have to have double extracted. I think you can just get everything out of a water extraction. But in general, a lot of the good mushroom companies will do a double extraction on everything. What are the active compounds in these mushrooms that are having the medicinal benefits? So the ones that all medicinal mushrooms have across the board are called beta-glucans, and those are a naturally occurring polysaccharide like sugar molecule that's inside all of the mushrooms. So the beta-glucans are the ones that interact directly with our immune system. 
And those are in all the mushrooms and that's all the medicinal mushrooms. And that's why all of the ones that I write about in the book, there's seven of them are good for the immune system. So people are always asking, what, what's the best one for the immune system? And I think a blend is probably the best for the immune system to take a blend of a bunch of different medicinal mushrooms because they all have awesome benefits. But each one of the mushrooms, in addition to those beta-glucans, also has their own compounds. So, you know, cordyceps, chaga, reishi, shiitake, all of them have a different compound that, that has different medicinal effects, which is why you want to take a lot of different ones. And I think it's important to highlight too with some of these mushrooms, I'm thinking specifically of like chaga and reishi, they're mushrooms you want to be taking on an ongoing basis. I mean, you can take them when you get sick and you need an immune boost, but they're better to be taken regularly and keeping your system toned up. Right. Because just like cannabis, the mushrooms can help to keep your system in balance. And so they're not you know, immune stimulating. They're more immune modulating, which is immune balancing. So they can really help to just keep everything in balance. So in that sense, yes, I treat them like a supplement. You know, a lot of the mushrooms are high in antioxidants and just have anti-tumor properties. So just taking them as a preventative and, you know, not just when you get sick is always a good idea. Something I found really fascinating in the book is when you talk about button mushrooms, cremines, and portobellos, and you talk about how they're all actually the same mushroom. <laughs> Elaborate on that. That was something that I was really surprised to learn about too. So buttons, cremines, and portobellos are actually the same species of mushroom. They're just at different ages. So a portobello is just a button mushroom that has gotten older and its cap has had time to expand. And those are the most common mushrooms that you're going to see at the grocery store. They're also the most important mushrooms to cook really well. So one of the things I learned while doing the research for this book is that these mushrooms, those three mushrooms in particular, have a compound called agaritine in them. And it's potentially carcinogenic if you eat them raw. And this is something that I think it's still kind of up for debate as to how serious that is. But most of the mushroom experts will say to just cook it really well because the agaritine will get cooked out. So if you're going to take any or have any of those mushrooms, they're probably the least medicinal of any of the mushrooms. But you just want to it's not that you shouldn't eat them. You just want to cook them really well. Where would somebody start if medicinal mushrooms are new to them? What would you recommend somebody get? You mentioned powders and tinctures. Just for the person that's a total newbie to this and wants to, you know, get out and get started, what would you recommend? Well, that will all depend on kind of what your lifestyle is like. So if you're the type of person who makes a smoothie every day, I would definitely suggest getting a powder extract of either one mushroom that you feel drawn to or a blend. There's a couple of companies that have really good mushroom blends that'll have, you know, seven to 10 different medicinal mushrooms in the blend. And then you can just take a scoop of that and add it to your smoothie. Same thing with, you know, coffee or tea. If you don't mind the earthiness of the taste of the mushrooms, you can just add a scoop of mushroom powders into your coffee or tea. My dad, for instance, he really prefers capsules because he is already taking a bunch of different medications and stuff. So he'll just add that in with his medicine. So capsules can be an option there. Although I personally don't think capsules are the best way because you don't, you don't ever know like if all of it's getting dissolved in your system. So I like powders or tinctures because you don't have to go through like the coating of the capsule. And if tinctures are easy for you, I think tinctures are really easy because if I'm not going to make a smoothie or if I'm not, you know, making a coffee, I can just easily wake up, take the tincture, swallow it down with water, and it's super easy. So I would say whatever you feel like is easiest to add into your routine is the best way to go. And then also just start to cook with more medicinal mushrooms. Yeah, maybe sub out when you're going to use, you know, Kermini or portobellos, maybe sub in shiitakes instead and make that upgrade. Exactly. Shiitakes are really easy to find at most grocery stores. So that's a really good way to easily get started with medicinal mushrooms. I have a actually a gravy recipe that I put in the book. It's a shiitake gravy, but I used to use Kerminis. They're also called baby bellas. I would use those every Thanksgiving and I would make this mushroom gravy. But while I was writing the book, I did the switch and I used shiitakes instead and it's way more delicious. So I would say, yeah, swap in shiitakes wherever possible. I definitely made a note of that recipe as I was reading through your book. It sounds amazing. Can't wait to try it. It's so good. <laughs> and since we're talking about medicinal mushrooms here, I think a lot of people could possibly make the mistake of thinking, you know, magic mushrooms and thinking there's some type of association there. But let's make the differentiation between medicinal mushrooms, the ones we've been talking about to this point, and the psychedelic magic mushrooms. 
that's one of the questions that I get most often is when I start to talk about medicinal mushrooms, people are always asking, well, are those the ones that are going to make you hallucinate? Like, am I going to hallucinate if I you know, put this packet of chaga powder into my tea? And the answer is no. All of the medicinal mushrooms that we've talked about so far are completely non-psychedelic and they're just, you know, food supplement grade mushrooms. Magic mushrooms, specifically the, you know, the most common ones that people know about with the compound called psilocybin, you know, those are the ones that are are going to take you on a trip. Yeah. And you talk about those in the book as well and dedicate a whole chapter to them talking about how there's some new research that's being done on psilocybin and psychedelics and and how it sounds like a lot of different states are starting to legalize psilocybin. And it'll be interesting to see how all that pans out over the next handful of years. Yeah, that's something that I'm really excited about personally, because, you know, psychedelics have had the same kind of reputation. Well, not the same, but a similar reputation to cannabis in the sense that they've just been associated with the counterculture and hippies and, you know, wanting to go on these psychedelic trips and and get high, but they're really showing, you know, benefits for mental health and specifically depression. That's a really interesting thing to keep our fingers on the pulse of because they're doing a lot of different research studies right now, you know, comparing using psilocybin to using SSRIs, antidepressants, and then, you know, in other ways, just showing people having remarkable results when they have treatment resistant depression, which is, you know, depression that hasn't responded well to medications or hasn't responded well to other therapies, psilocybin is really helping them improve. So I think that within the next few years, we will see psilocybin legal for use in therapy. I don't know when, but it's really exciting to think about and have these mushrooms being elevated to, you know, a real medicine that could change. I think it could really change mental health. Now we're going to take another quick break from our chat with Jenny to give a shout out to our show partner, Organifi. Organifi has a product called Immunity that combines the helpful nutrients that you already know, like zinc, vitamin C, and vitamin D3, with revolutionary new discoveries like ultrasonic extracted mushroom beta-glucans. So it's tradition and modern science combined. Each box contains 14 single-serve packets that you can take with you anywhere, and all you need to do is mix them with water and you're good to go. So it's recommended you take one serving to support your immune system and two servings when you're fighting a cold. And Organifi products are always organic, gluten-free, soy-free, vegan, and keto-friendly. All things Marnie and I love to see. And as a listener of our show, you get 20% off your Organifi purchase by going to ultimahealthpodcast.com slash Organifi. Again, that URL is ultimahealthpodcast.com slash Organifi. And Organifi is spelled O-R-G-A-N. IFI. Get yourself some of the Organifi immunity today and help support your immune system. Now we're going to give a shout out to our other show partner, Perfect Keto. Perfect Keto Keto Bars are a protein bar with only 3 grams of net carbs with no sugar, sugar alcohols, additives, or fillers, and they taste absolutely delicious. They come in a wide array of flavors including birthday cake, cinnamon roll, salted caramel, almond butter brownie, lemon poppy seed, and my personal favorite, chocolate chip cookie dough. Each box contains 12 bars. They make a perfect snack on the go and they're very satisfying. And as a listener of our show, you get 20% off your Perfect Keto purchase by going to ultimahealthpodcast.com slash perfect keto. Again, that URL is ultimahealthpodcast.com slash perfect keto. Perfect keto products ship worldwide. If you live in the US, you get free shipping. Go and give the keto bars a try today. They're going to become your favorite snack. And now back to our chat with Jenny. Earlier, we talked about microdosing with THC, and you share a story in your book about microdosing with psilocybin and how you're over the years been prone to depression and taking this small dose. And I'll have you elaborate on what that actually looks like. I think you describe the depression as kind of like an elephant stepping on your chest, and then taking the microdose was like having that step off of you and and give you that peaceful, blissful feeling. So share what happened there. Before I get into it, I will say, you know, one of the things I always have to say is that I don't recommend people experiment with psychedelics on their own. You know, I do share my microdosing experience because I think it's important to, you know, have people learn about it. 
But in general, if you are going to use psychedelics, I would say do it in the hands of a trained guide or therapist or at least someone that you really trust that can kind of look over you and and watch over you and make sure you're safe because taking a little bit too much of of a psychedelic can bring you to places that you don't want to go, especially alone. So just a disclaimer there, it is illegal and not to be experimented with alone. But my microdosing experience, I was reading um, Michael Pollan's book, How to Change Your Mind, and he talks a lot about psilocybin and depression and the studies that are going on. And like you said, I have you know experienced depression throughout my life in a way that doesn't feel like it's necessarily connected to a specific topic. Like it's not always situational. Sometimes it just feels really physical to me. And, you know, everyone that experiences depression will experience it a little differently, but for me, it sometimes just feels like this heaviness. And yeah, I wrote about it as this elephant stepping on my chest because that's what it feels like to me. I can look around my life and say nothing's wrong, but I feel this physical heaviness and it's like this sadness and heaviness that I just can't shake. And when I started experimenting with microdosing psilocybin, that feeling was lifted and I was able to start to just see my world more clearly for what it was without feeling that heaviness there. And that was really huge. And that's one of the reasons that I feel really excited about the research that's going on, because I could see immediately after my first experiment with psilocybin, I could understand why they were why they were using it in depression studies. With your experience over the years with cannabis, have you had any positive results in the realm of depression taking that at all? Yeah, I mean, CBD because it relieves it can relieve anxiety it can also kind of just have this mood uplifting effect thc in very small doses can have the same mood lifting up uplifting effect i think for me personally a little bit too much thc can cause anxiety and i think other people experience the same so a little too much and you kind of can get into this anxiety paranoia zone but taking a tiny amount of it can be this like gentle mood boost. So like I said, it's so personal, but I do think both cannabis and and psychedelic mushrooms and some of the medicinal mushrooms, lion's mane in particular, has been shown to help with mood. I think having an array of these things in your life could be a, a good you know, therapeutic toolbox. And Jenny, I'd love for you to take us through a typical day and what your cannabis and your medicinal mushroom consumption looks like starting in the morning and going through the afternoon all the way to night. I do not take CBD every morning because I don't always need it. If I'm feeling anxious in the morning, I will take a really small dose of CBD, like maybe five milligrams, probably max 10. If I take anything over 25 milligrams of CBD, personally, that's when I start to feel a little bit too mellow. And for me, with working, I like to have, you know, a little bit of edge. Like I don't want to feel so relaxed that I don't feel, you know, motivated to work. But sometimes I'll have a little bit of, you know, morning anxiety. So I'll take a little bit of CBD on a case by case basis in the morning. If I'm not feeling anxiety, I will definitely go for the mushrooms. So I take lion's mane chaga in the mornings, sometimes reishi, but reishi can chill you out too. It can kind of calm down your nervous system. So if I don't want that calming effect, I won't take reishi in the morning. So I'll take chaga and lion's mane. And usually I take those in a tincture. Alternatively, I'll put some powder into a coffee, and that's either just chaga, just lion's mane, or a blend, or cordyceps. Ooh, yeah, <laughs> it's hard to say a typical day because I kind of take them on a case by case basis. But cordyceps is one of those medicinal mushrooms that can actually help you with energy. So I'm feeling a little tired. I'll I'll either add cordyceps to tea or coffee. So any of those mushrooms can be happening in the morning. Later during the day. I guess sort of the same thing. I mean, I don't I'm not on a super strict schedule with taking the mushrooms. Sometimes I'll just, you know, remember to take them at different times. But I really like to have a chaga tea in the afternoon. It really can just help me feel grounded, especially if I've been staring at the screen all day. Chaga is one of those mushrooms that really it just tastes so earthy, but like in a good way. It's not bitter. It's kind of subtly sweet. So chaga tea in the afternoon is really nice. Alternatively, if I'm feeling like I need an energy boost in the afternoon, I'll take some cordyceps. So put some cordyceps in a tea and get a little energy boost if I need that in the afternoon. At night, that's when I use the CBD and cannabis products the most. Before I go to bed, I probably take around 30 to 50 milligrams of CBD in a tincture. 
And I also use a topical. I broke my tailbone a few years ago. And so sometimes it can feel achy. So I'll take this one to one ratio of CBD to THC, a topical. I'll rub it on any painful areas before I go to bed. Oh, yeah. And then for mushrooms at night, I always take reishi at night because it can be really soothing to the nervous system. Yeah, I'm a fan of reishi at night as well. And the thing I find, like I've experimented a whole ton with medicinal mushrooms over the years, not so much with cannabis, a little bit with CBD oil, but I'm intrigued to, to get deeper into it after reading your book. But for me with the medicinal mushrooms, the hardest part for me is getting into a regular routine. You know, I'll try some capsules or a tincture. I'm a big fan of the Four Sigmatic products as well. And, and that's usually how I have my Rishi at night. But for me, it's like having that longevity with that routine. Because I know they're so good for me and they fill a, a unique niche within my health and wellness routine. But again, after reading your book, I'm definitely inspired to take it up a notch and, and fit these into my regular routine. Yeah. And one of the things that's really helpful for me, you know, when I'm at my apartment in Brooklyn, which I'm I'm not right now because of every, what's going on in New York City. But in my apartment, I have kind of this coffee and tea station set up where I have all the different mushrooms just out there right on the counter. So I can always remember to at least add one mushroom to my coffee or tea or a smoothie. And they're all just kind of there as a little buffet. I really love, like I said, using a blend. And I think that's a, a really good place to start for people who just want to start to put mushrooms into their life. Maybe they don't feel super drawn to a specific mushroom, but they just want to get a general immune balancing effect and the general health effects of a bunch of different mushrooms. I would say a powder blend is a really good place to go. And I've done that too over the years. I've mixed that into my morning coffee. And as a coffee drinker, I know I'm going to get my morning coffee in. So I know if I have the powder there, it's going to fit into that routine. Yeah, I think that's the key is to figure out where your routines are and just add them into that place. You know, and also I have a little array of things set up for my my nightly routine where next to my bed I have, you know, my little CBD tincture and my reishi tincture. And, you know, you just kind of make these things easy, easy to grab onto in, in the normal re routines of your day. What about your dad? What's his routine look like when it comes to medicinal mushrooms and cannabis? Because obviously there's a lot of people out there dealing with cancer. Or they know somebody dealing with cancer and you're somebody that's that's done the research and applied this over quite a period of time with your dad. I know everybody's going to have individual cases and need to tweak it to their own individual necessities. But just to give people a starting place, what are some of the things your dad's doing? Yeah. So I guess just to loop back to the story about my dad and just say where he's at today, it's been two and a half years since he got diagnosed. And he's now his blood markers that, you know, measure for the tumor activity are back in the normal range, which is really awesome. And his scans have been stable and dormant for a long time. So the tumors are still there. It's very difficult to cure stage four pancreatic cancer and have it completely go away. Not impossible, but it's one of the more difficult ones. So his tumors are still there, but they haven't been active in quite a long time. And he's actually been off of chemo for the last three months because he's been doing so well. And he just had another scan and another blood work checkup. And he's he's doing great just on the cannabis and mushrooms without the chemo. Wow. So happy to hear about his progress. Congrats to you guys. It's really cool. <laughs> yeah, I've been quarantined here with, with my parents. And we keep joking that we forgot that he had cancer because he's just he doesn't complain. He feels great. And it's just not our it's not our primary focus right now, luckily, because he just feels so good. That's incredible. So what's he doing now to maintain his health and well-being? What his routine is with the cannabis and mushrooms. So he takes a cannabis oil every day, which is usually at the dispensaries. It's called Rick Simpson oil. And it's either called Rick Simpson oil or sometimes it's called full extract cannabis oil. But if you say Rick Simpson oil to someone at a dispensary, they will know what you're talking about. It's a very thick, high potency oil. You would not just take this as a recreational thing. It is really medicinal, super strong like 50 milligrams of THC and CBD in a tiny, tiny drop. And so he's taking a drop of this oil the size of a grain of rice twice a day, once in the morning and once at night. He used to take three in a day, but he just felt like the THC was a little bit too much for him to get everything done in a day that he wanted to do. So he'll just take two doses now. So he takes that twice a day. He's on probably about 100 milligrams of CBD only, the capsules that we originally started him on just because he's been doing so well that we just kept him on these CBD capsules even after he had access to the to the medical products. 
So he's taking CBD. He's taking that cannabis oil. He'll do the CBD in the morning and at night as well. And then for medicinal mushrooms, he takes, I believe, four capsules of AHCC, which is the one that I said is derived from shiitake mushrooms. And this supplement in particular is really, really interesting because they use it in cancer hospitals in China and Japan alongside chemotherapy to keep patients' immune system strong. And there's been studies to show that this supplement in particular can help the immune system. You know, with chemotherapy, it can weaken your immune system. And that's why a lot of patients can't tolerate it for very long. So my dad's oncologist said that people typically take eight to 10 rounds of the chemo that he's been on, and then they have to take a break or their body just starts to break down. He's been on over 50 rounds and totally fine. So I really think it's the mushrooms that have been keeping his immune system strong during this whole time. So he's on the AHCC. And then he takes a blend, a 10 blend. It's actually four sigmatic, a blend of um, 10 mushrooms that he takes in a smoothie every day. And turkey tail mushroom, he, he also adds to the smoothie. And again, these things can be interchanged. You don't have to put one in a smoothie and take one as a capsule. You can kind of take them however you want to take them. But he takes the turkey tail mushroom and the 10 blend in a smoothie. And then he also takes, I believe, two capsules, but maybe four at this point of lion's mane because that has been really helpful for him with his neuropathy. So neuropathy is nerve damage in the, in, often in the fingers and toes that can happen from chemotherapy. And after two weeks of taking lion's mane, that neuropathy started to go away for him. So he's been taking that as well. So all the different mushrooms can do different things, but yeah, he's, he's on all of them. <laughs> and is that protocol pretty similar to when he was going through chemo? I know you mentioned the Rick Simpson oil and how he, I think it was the dose in the middle of the day, he stopped taking that. But how different were things back when he was doing chemo versus now? He's taking everything the same. So because things have been going so well, we haven't changed anything. The only change we've made throughout the whole process was to add in the lion's mane because of the neuropathy. But everything else has been the same since the beginning. And I guess what I should say is with the Rick Simpson oil specifically, that has helped him a lot with nausea and appetite. And those are two things that many chemotherapy patients will complain about is being nauseous all the time and not being able to eat. That leads them to lose too much weight and it becomes really problematic overall. And that's the THC. I mean, the CBD and the THC, but particularly the THC can help with that nausea and appetite. It can make you hungry and it can make you, you know, be able to tolerate full meals again. So I've heard from many people messaging me on Instagram saying, you know, my dad had no appetite and was losing all this weight and was constantly nauseous. We got him on the oil and now he can eat again. And that is just for someone that has no appetite and is losing all that weight. It's incredible to have that feeling. And we haven't talked a lot about brands throughout the interview here. We've mentioned Four Sigmatic, but when it comes to quality, how do we know we're getting a good quality product? Because I know in the book, you talk about CBD specifically, and I think it was a study that showed around 70% of supplements tested didn't actually have the correct amount of CBD that it said on the label. So obviously a concern if somebody's taking the time to you know properly supplement and spending the money, how do we know we're getting a good product? Great question. Right now, CBD is totally unregulated. So anybody can just put out a CBD product and make claims that may or may not be true. So what's really important right now, I really do think this is going to change as things get more regulated. But right now, looking at a lab test for your CBD product is really important. What that is, is basically a third party lab test to show exactly what's in the product, how much CBD is in it, how much THC is in it, what other compounds, if any, are also in it. So A good CBD company will either have the lab test available to download on their website directly, or you can email them at their contact information and say, hey, do you have a lab test for this product? And they'll typically be able to give you one. If they can't give you one, I would not buy that product and I would go with a a product that can give you a lab test. And what you'll want to look for there is, does the amount of CBD match what it says on the label? If it says it's a full spectrum product, are there other cannabinoids and terpenes in the product or is it just a CBD isolate that's masquerading as full spectrum? So those are the things you want to look for. And then also you can see on these lab tests if it's been tested for heavy metals, pesticides and other solvents that can sometimes stay in the product during the processing. 
Okay, that's great. And Jenny, I want to thank you so much for sharing your story, sharing your dad's story. And I'm just so happy to hear he's been on the mend and he's doing so well. I just have one final question for you. What does ultimate health mean to you? Ultimate health to me would be would be feeling energy. I mean, to me, when I think ultimate health, I think energy and vitality and vibrancy. So just being able to wake up and have the energy and vibrancy to do the things that you want to do in the world, I think that's ultimate health. Love it. And if you're looking for a little kick of energy from medicinal mushrooms, we know cordyceps is the one to try. Yep, absolutely. (laughs) All right, Jenny, the new book, The Rebels Apothecary. Awesome read. I learned so much. And like I mentioned before, I've played around with medicinal mushrooms and continue to on a regular basis, but I'm re-inspired to go even deeper into those. And I'm inspired to get deeper into cannabis as well. So thank you for writing this. And thank you again for sharing everything on the show. This is great information that's going to help so many people. Other than the listeners getting a copy of your new book, how can they connect with you after the show? Well, thank you so much for having me. This has been an awesome conversation. I love to hear your enthusiasm about all of this. It's just, it's great to connect in that way. Besides the book, well, the book is The Rebel's Apothecary, which is officially out May 19th. And other than that, a really easy way to find me is on Instagram at Jenny Sansusi. And my blog is healthycrush.com. All right. We're going to link it all up in the show notes. Again, Jenny, great conversation. Thank you so much and wishing you all the best and your dad too. Thanks for having me. Thank you. You too. What a great conversation I had with Jenny. I really hope you enjoyed it. And we'd love to hear what you thought of the conversation, what you took away from it over on Instagram. And you can tag at Jenny Sansusi and at Ultimate Health Podcast. You can tag the player. You can take a picture of yourself, do a short video. We'd love to see you over there. And for full show notes, be sure and check out ultimatehealthpodcast.com slash 352. We're going to have links there to everything we discussed today in a show summary. So be sure and check that out. And before we let you go, I want to give some love to our editor and engineer, Jace Sanderson over at podcasttech.com. Jace, we really appreciate all the hard work you put in. Thank you so much. And this week's fun fact about Jace is that him and his wife are growing some blueberries, blackberries, and raspberries in their garden planter right now. And interesting timing, we actually just finished planting our outdoor garden beds today. And it's just such an exciting time of year for gardening. Have an awesome week. We'll talk soon. Wishing you ultimate health.